afternoon, ladies and gents. Simon Brown here doing this afternoon's presentation, managing risk within a trading portfolio. So what are we talking about? And I've got an extreme example here. You're geared long in a derivative, whatever that might be, and you've got gold stocks galore, gold fields, Harmony, Anglo Gold Ashanti, uh, Village and others. Gold crashes to a thousand rand, strengthens to nine against the dollar, and essentially your portfolio gets wiped out. And, and, and this is an absolute extreme example, but is it impossible? It's not impossible. It might be improbable. And that's what we're looking at here, is, is what happens when a market moves suddenly against you. Now, I'll touch on the slow move against you, but in truth, the slow move is in many ways easier to manage. That's just a stop loss. But it's that very quick, sharp move when things happen very, very quickly. And if we're trading, particularly in the derivative space, we really are sitting on, on, on fairly significant risk. And if we go back to the crash of 87, the market from closed to open, closed on Monday, opened on Tuesday, minus 22%. In the crisis of 2008, uh, from top to bottom, the market lost 50%. In truth, in the worst single week, which was the week Lehman's went down, uh, down 20% in a single week. And as I said, really looking here at trading is distinct from investing. So what about a market crash? I mean, the point is crashes happen. But we can't, we can't live in fear of a crash. We, it, you know, if, if you're going to wake up every day worrying if today will be the crash, or worse, try and go to bed every night wondering if tonight will be the crash, we, we're going to have zero quality of life. Uh, if we're going to take it the other way and cash out and keep on going short, well, what happened during the bull markets? We're going to get wiped out. And it doesn't even need to be a crash. I mean, if you geared seven times, which is an average CFD or, or single stock future or warrant gearing, 14% move, that takes you to zero. So it doesn't have to necessarily be a massive move to significantly harm your, your, your trading portfolio. So how do we manage it? A bunch of ways. Uh, uncorrelated assets across different sectors, long dated out the money options, indices, elders 6% rule, trade versus invest, and of course, stop loss. And I end, I'll come and, and show you how I personally manage it. Because when I, when I conceived the idea for this webcast, I, I knew that there wasn't going to be a silver bullet, that, that one thing, do this problem solved. Perhaps there is a silver bullet to a degree, but it's not a, a simple silver bullet. And if there is one, perhaps it's long dated out the money options, uh, put options. But there really isn't in a sense. It's more of a collective process that, that, that we need to think of. That's why at the end of the presentation, I will look at how I manage the process and that potential risk within my portfolio. The first is to trade uncorrelated assets. In other words, don't trade Standard Bank and Nedbank. They're the same thing. They're both a bank. If one's crashing, quite probably the other is as well. But then, so we say, okay, so we'll trade Standard Bank and Billiton. But if markets are crashing, well, so will they be. So what do you want to do? You want to trade some general equities, uh, some, some commodities, soft and hard. Uh, soft would be your agries, such as maize, wheat, corn, uh, uh, pork belly and the like, coffee, sugar, whatever the case may be. And hards, which would be your metals, your gold, your, your, your uh, uh, platinum, etc. They're often uncorrelated to general equities, particularly your softs. Particularly, thing corn is driven. Maize in South Africa is driven by rain, not only in locally rain in Brazil, rain wherever the major growing areas are. But there's no correlation to financial assets. Currencies again in a crash, particularly in an emerging market currency, there certainly is some correlation. But if you perhaps look at uh, dollar yen or maybe a bad example, dollar euro, perhaps a better example, the correlation between that and equity markets is almost not there at all. So it gives you that break. So if one is crashing, the other one quite possibly is not crashing. So you're not wiping out a portfolio. And then of course, local foreign, that's not a, a massive, there is a lot, a fair bit of correlation between our market and global markets. Certainly when you know, the global financial crisis was a, an American issue, but it affected the whole world. Uh, correlation between the US markets and South Africa is not as strong as many say, but at the extremes, in other words, when, 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 when U.S. markets are plummeting, well, we go down with them. And for the simple reason is that uh, asset managers who invested in New York are selling everything, including South African assets. 
So your best here is to really go trade some equities, some dollar euros, and some uh, wheat. Gives you three assets that are broadly uncorrelated. If one of them is having a really, really rough time of it, others potentially not. Potentially the important word there, of course. There's no sure things here whatsoever. When we trade equities, it goes back to within a sector. I've always said to folks, you know what? Trade top 40 equities and go and trade different, different sectors. Don't trade Anglo and Billiton. They're the same thing. Standard Bank and First Rand, MTN and Vodacom. For example, and that's just an example I've thrown out there. Standard Bank, Richmond, uh, ShopRite, Billiton, MTN. Nice and different, different industries, different drivers. You know, ShopRite's going to be driven to a large degree by what's happening at, 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 at a consumer level, particularly mid and lower income consumers. MTN's going to be driven by, frankly, how many people can it get on its networks and how much data can it sell them. Billiton, commodity market, predominantly iron ore. Richmond, luxury market, predominantly China. So you've got different drivers. Again, in the crisis of 2008, all five of these shares went under serious pressure. But you've got that diverse across the different sectors. So if a particular sector gets hit, if the consumer gets hard hit, ShopRite's going to be under pressure. The other four, no. Iron Org takes a pasting. Billiton's under pressure. The other four, not a problem. Some correlation, China gets hit, Richmond and Billiton will be under pressure. The other three, nope, they'll be doing fine. So you see what we're doing here? We're trying to trade things that are going to have different inputs impacting the price. Obviously, their own issues are going to drive it, but the bigger issues, I'm trying to get those, those the diverging, uncorrelated, bigger issues in order to trade the various different stocks. Probably the best one, and, and, and is a long-dated, out-the-money put option. Warrants probably best known. So what I'm a put, you buy a put, it gives you the right to sell something. So as the underlying is falling, the put warrant will be increasing in value. You want long dated, ideally nine to 12 months. You also want out the money. What do I mean by out the money? So if the market now, top 40 is currently at 42,000, you want your strike between 36 and 38,000. It's about 10 to 15% away. What that does is it means it will be relatively cheap. There won't be a heck lot of time decay in that option. And if the market then falls and breaches the 36 or 38,000, suddenly it will just start significantly increasing in value. As the market moves towards 36, 38,000, the increase in value will start to happen. As you move through that level, you'll get a spike in the increase. And then as you fall further away, the increase will slow down. So I used to always have myself a long dated put warrant on the index in my portfolio, just a small position. And, and I took it, it was perhaps the, the total cost of it was perhaps half a percent, maybe 1% of my total portfolio. And my view was, this was an insurance policy, that when the market collapsed, it would generate me some profit. And, and it would take off some of the, the nastiness in terms of that collapse. So I had it all the way up and including the crisis of 2008, I had some of these. Well, I had a long dated, out the money, put warrant, in my portfolio. And it did exactly as it was supposed to do. It went up in value significantly. The problem was, is that well, a couple of problems. Firstly, its value went from like 1% and it, it went up a couple of hundred percent, but then it maybe made me 2% profit on my portfolio. My portfolio lost 34. So it didn't offset a heck of a lot. More than that is I'd had one every year for like about the previous five years. I think I kicked it off in 2003, which means I'd bought one for six years. So for six years, I'd put a percentage of my portfolio in a long dated put option. And in the sixth year, I made three or 4% back of the entire total value. So I lost six uh, uh, chunks and I made three. I actually net came out behind. And I looked at it and I thought, hmm, I don't know, not so attractive. And I suppose it depends. Uh, yeah, 2008 was particularly bad, perhaps. You know, if we're looking at a 20% at a drawdown in the market, then we're probably in a significantly better space. Uh, 2008 really did collapse. So I looked at this, and it came 2009. Uh, and I'll be honest, two things struck me. The one is, over the long term, this didn't work particularly well. It, it worked, but over a six-year period, it didn't. And of course, if I'd had it over a 10-year period, then I would have included the, the earlier bear market uh, that followed 9-11. Uh, 
and Iran collapsed and then as it strengthened and we hit a bear market into 2002 through to early 2004. Perhaps then I would have come out even in the process. There's other ways you can do direct options, and, and uh, Garth McKenzie does a lot of them. If you go to his website, uh, traderscorner.coza, you'll find information there. I've interviewed him at mortstreet.com on JC Direct. In essence, it's buying an insurance policy. It's not a perfect policy. You can make it perfect. In other words, you can make it so that more or less your profit will offset your loss. But in, in the years where we don't have the, 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 the sell-off, we're going to struggle. The other issue that we're finding now is it's very difficult to find particularly a warrant that is long dated out the money. So we'd have to go the option route and a lot of brokers don't offer it. So not perfect and as I said, I've moved away from it. We can just trade indices. So this is one of the strategies that I've moved towards. Indices are inherently less volatile. For a stock to have a big day, 5% move, not uncommon. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't even happen every month. And in fact, sometimes not even every year. But think about the African banks. Think about some of those stocks that have seen fairly significant sell-offs. And there we're talking sort of 8, 10, 12% in a single day. And we all know stocks that have had otherwise big moves in one single day for whatever reason, usually stock-specific reasons, bad trading update, bad results, CEO quitting, or something like that. Yet for an index to do 5% in a day, that's a huge deal. That's a massive deal and hardly happens. I can't remember. In fact, I'm going to be bold and say probably the last time we had a 5% day on the index was back in 2008. And prior to that, probably it was 9-11, uh, so 2001. So indices by their very nature are less volatile because they are a basket. And being a basket makes them less volatile. So one of the ways I managed that process was by saying, I don't trade stocks. Now, there are two reasons I don't trade stocks. One is, as I state here, it's the indices being less volatile. The other is, as I, with my media work, you know, I don't want to have to be on TV and say, yes, I own Billiton, but I'm short Billiton. And it, it, so I just thought, you know what, I'll, I'll publish my portfolio. It's on my vanity website, simonbrown.coza, and I will focus on trading indices. I'm also a trend trader. And, and being less volatile, trends are much better, much easier to trade within an index. Stocks get trends, but those trends are very volatile. You know, you look at Aspen, look at NASPAS, look at those stocks that have got massive upward trends. And what you'll see is fairly significant drawdowns along the way. Look at our top 40. I mean, the trend we've had now over the last year or two, I'm not sure that we've even had as much as a 10% drawdown during that entire period of the trend. So then we also come to Elder's 6% rule. I've done a complete 30-minute video on Elder. Um, so you, you'll find that there's the, the short link there, joo.to slash question mark 93. will take you to the full 30-minute video. I don't want to spend too much time on it now. Um, one, because I'm not convinced by it. And, and, and two, uh, as I said, there's full video. Elder says, quite simply, never have more than 6% of your portfolio at risk at any one stage. So remember the 2% rule? You enter three trades today, each of them at 2% of risk. So each trade 2% risk, total risk 6%. You cannot enter a new trade. Now, my problem with this was, okay, what happens when trade D comes along? You can't enter it. Mark Douglas says, you know what, you need to enter every trade because you don't know which are the winners and losers. You can't be picking and choosing. And this locks you out of the market. And that's why I've always said I don't like Elder. But then I think about it and putting this presentation together, I thought, well, hang on, a couple of things. Firstly, I could run 1% risk per share. So 1% risk per share means I could be in six trades. That is a lot of trades. For me personally, I'm never going to be in more than five. I trade Aussie Futures, uh, Finney Indy, Midcap, and Resi. So I'm never going to be in more than five trades anyway. And I run them at about 1% risk. So my, in essence, I'm doing the elder, port, the elder system anyway. Maybe that's it. Maybe this is the best way that we manage that risk, where we say, you know what, we're running 1% risk per trade, and we're only going to trade a couple of products. So we're never going to have 10 trades at a time. So you're only in five, 
You've got 1% risk for each. Now, a market crash, you're going to go sliding through your stop loss. But you're going to, maybe you end up losing three times what you expect. You've lost 15%. Nasty, but you're not wiped out. So suddenly I'm thinking, in a way I'm doing older, maybe it's not so bad. So he says three trades, 2% each, you can't enter a new trade. And then one of your trades, trade A, moves in your favor and you increase the stop loss. For example, you got in at 10 Rand, your stop loss was 9 Rand. You worked out your 2% rule, you entered the trade. It's now moved in your favor, your stop loss is now at 9 Rand 50. So your risk per share was 1 Rand, now it's 50 cents. So trade A is now only 1% risk at capital. In other words, 5% of your portfolio at risk, one from A and two each from B and C, you can now get into a new trade with 1% at risk. Take it a step further, trade B gets completely stopped out. So you've got trade A with 1% risk, trade B, sorry, C with 2% risk, you've only got 3% at risk, you can enter new trades to a value of 3% at risk. And I do think, I talk about the 2% rule, and, and I, I, if you haven't viewed the 2% rule, go to justonelap.com, type 2% in the search field, and you'll find the video on the 2% rule. And I, I talk about it a lot, but in truth, I then say, you know, is 2% perhaps not too aggressive? Personally, I'm trading 1% risk per trade. Significantly less risky. And I might have, at maximum, I will have five trades on the go at a time. Four of them ungeared. So we need significant disaster to happen for that portfolio to take a bad, bad hit. Another problem we have is too much capital in our trading portfolio. And I, I understand what's happening here. We, we have a portfolio. What are we doing? We, we have a small amount of money. We say, forget the investing. We're going to trade. When we've got a, a significantly larger amount of money, we'll put some money into investing. Wrong way around. Truth is, when you start trading, you're going to wipe out. When you're an expert trader, you may still wipe out. You should do it the other way around. Build up an investment portfolio first. Once we have an investment portfolio and a core satellite, so we've got ETFs and a couple of sprinkling of quality blue chips, once we've got that right, we can start doing some trading. And we keep the trading less than 20% of your entire investment horizon. So you've got 100,000 Rand in the market, 80,000 in, 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 your, in your investment portfolio, and that would be blue chips and ETFs, and 20,000 in your trading portfolio. To my mind, ideally, perhaps even less than 10%. In fact, so you'd have 90,000 invested and 10% for trading. Your trading portfolio gets wiped out, no sweat. you still got 90K left. And during a market uh, pull down, et cetera, you've got quality stocks, you've got ETFs. So what do you do? Yeah, your investment portfolio is going to take pressure, but it's going to survive. So you ride through it. And perhaps also less gearing. We look at trading and we say, hmm, trading equals gearing. That's not true. I, I, I actually trade three portfolios. My momentum portfolio is a trading portfolio because its duration is less than three years. So if it's a trading portfolio, uh, but I have no gearing in it, zero gearing, equities only. I trade my lazy weekly system, which trades the Indy, Finney, Resi, and Midcap. I trade the, the ETFs, again, zero gearing. And then in my last portfolio, I trade Aussie futures on a daily top 40. So I've got three portfolios, but only one of them is geared. And the three portfolios, if we run it across, they're all about equal size. So only a third of my trading is actually in geared product. And we look at it and we say, but how are we going to make money without gearing? The point is, is that if our market is doing, and I think the, the, the long-term average for our market going forward is probably going to be low, single, low double digits, 12 or 13%. If we're doing 20 or 25% a year, we are creating significant wealth. This is not about getting rich in a hurry. There's only one way we get rich in a hurry. We marry money. Everything else takes time. And what's critically important is ensuring that we stay in the game. So rather than leaping into trading, we should leap into investing. In fact, we should leap into an ETF. Go by the, the NetBank Equal Weighted, BBET40. Once you've got a, a core of that, start putting some blue chips around it. Your Willies, your Sassels, your ShopRites, et cetera, et cetera, MTNs and the like. And once you've got that structured, then start putting some money into the trading space. So that if our trading portfolio wipes out or takes a significant hit, we're still in the game. And that is always the important point. We need to live to fight another day. That 
is absolutely critical. So it's about investing first. It's also saying, you know what? Trading does not have to be gearing. And then, of course, stop loss. I mean, it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it. And if you're not sure about stop loss, go to just one lap, click on the stop loss button in the, in the tag cloud, and you'll find tons of videos. It's quite simple. If you don't have a stop loss, you will wipe out. And particularly for a new trader, stop loss is perhaps one of the hardest parts of trading because stop loss is out and out psychology. So it, it's critically important that we accept that we are going to action the stop loss, that we have it in place and that we do action it. I make money trading for one simple reason. I'm brilliant at stop loss. I'm not brilliant at where I place it. I'm like everybody else. Placing a stop loss is, is it, it, it's not even an art. It, it, it's, it's almost, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a random process. But every single time my stop loss has been hit for 14 years, I have exited. That is why I make money, because I don't have huge losers. And if I don't have huge losers, suddenly my big winners, which are massively infrequent, but those big winners suddenly add up. The single biggest way to manage your risk is to have a stop loss and to then action it when it's hit every time, zero questions asked. So how do I manage the process personally? Well, only about 4% of my portfolio is in trading. And, and I'm, 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 I'm aiming on that word, uh, only about 4%. It, it fluctuates. It depends what's happening. If my, if my trading portfolio is doing well and my share portfolio is doing poorly, that number might be up at 5 6 maybe even 7%. If my share portfolio is doing brilliantly and my trading is doing poorly, that number might be down at maybe 2 or 3%. It's probably averaging around four, five percent per time. So I'm an investor first and foremost. I did a presentation earlier in the week, uh, Tuesday, and uh, someone was saying to me afterwards, "Am I an investor or a trader?" And it was a difficult number answer for me because if I look at the amount of money, I'm an out-and-out -out investor, like 90 plus percent. And and understand, of 100 percent, I have about 44 percent in ETFs, about four percent in in trading, so half of it in in general equities. So the answer was hard to do because the majority of my of my portfolio in total sits in investing. But in truth, what I do best, is I'm a trader. I'm not a, a brilliant fundamentalist. I'm not a brilliant stock picker. I, 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 I bumble along and I make some money and I beat the market. That's not my core competency. I'm not a CFA. I'm not a CA. I'm not even an analyst in that sense. Trading's where my core is. But I don't have a heck lot of money there in large part because of the risk. I also mostly trade ungeared. As I said, of all of my systems, I have three systems I trade. Momentum and lazy are ungeared. The only exception is my lazy Aussie. That is a geared trading system. But predominantly, I'm not trading much geared product. And I appreciate Aussie is risk. Make no mistake about it. Uh, you know, if, if our market crashes overnight, I, I'm currently long this market. I think I've got 12 contracts. Um, if our market crashes overnight, that is going to hurt massively. Uh, it just a just crazy amount. Even though I'm running at 1% risk, it's going to be a massively large amount of pain. But it's a survivable amount of pain. And that is the important point. If we want to completely remove the risk, well, we exit the market, we keep our money in, money market funds, cash. We, need, we have to accept we are taking some risk. The question is, how much? And then for me, as I said, stop loss. What I do best in my trading world, it's not technical analysis, it's not nothing, it is about stop loss. I'm rigid with my 1% rule, I'm rigid with my stop loss. And that is what keeps me going in the game for so very much longer. So a quick recap, and an important point, and I haven't touched on it yet, but I've alluded to it. Is the risk a lack of discipline or is it market risk? And what do I mean by that? Is the risk that you are encountering actually your inability to take proper risk management, i.e. position size, 2% rule? Um, perhaps you're trading with simply too small a portfolio. Perhaps you're only trading and you don't have an investment portfolio. And the question's coming through, if I've got other investments, for example, perhaps a, a pension scheme at work, uh, perhaps a unit trust or something, would I include that in an investment portfolio? Yes, and I do. 
I, I have, uh, uh, they're now paid up, but pension schemes from the, the two permanent employments I've had in my life, uh, Standard Bank a couple of years ago, and uh, I've spent a year working at Stake Inicor about 20 years ago. In fact, exactly 20 years ago. I joined in uh, May 1994. So I include those in my portfolio. But is it perhaps the market or is it you? And if it is you, and this is going to be a hard question you have to ask yourself, but in truth, the answer is quite simple. You know if you are the risk. You know if you're doing proper risk management. You know if you're adhering to stop losses. And if you're not, well, then the risk is probably more you than market. And that is the first point you need to fix. You need to make sure that you have the discipline, that you enforce that risk profile onto your portfolio. And as I said, it's about less trading versus investing. First, build an investment portfolio. This is a long-term game. This is something that plays out, I was going to say over decades. In truth, it plays out over the rest of our life. So we need to make sure we get it right. Things can go wrong. Markets will crash. There will be, and I don't know about a market crash. I mean, what we saw in 1987, we haven't seen since. But we have had the emerging market crisis of 98. Well, in fact, if you step back, we have the 1994 sort of early 90s fears when South Africa was moving to a democracy. We had the emerging market crisis of 98. We had the bear market, 9-11, and the preceding bear market. We had the 2008-9 financial crisis. None of those were crashes in the sense of 1987 or 1969, where you woke up one day and the market was obliterated overnight. They were, they were like swan doves. I mean, yes, our market lost massive amounts of value, but it gave you a lot of time to exit. And that's what's important. And we need to exit. We need that discipline. And again, less gearing. I, I, I say it often, and when I do my trade to trade world presentations, when I do them face to face, I talk about less gearing. We think trading has to be gearing. And the reason is simple. We come to market with a pile of money, and whatever size that pile is, we think it's too small. How am I going to get rich with such a small pile of money? So what do we do? Well, we say to ourselves, I know, we'll gear it. So you've got 20,000 and you gear it times seven and bang, you've now got 140,000. That's great, unless it goes wrong, because your risk is 140,000. So your 20 could become minus 120. So I think it's a lot about less gearing. We do not need to gear ourselves to make profits. Yes, gearing, in, 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 in the perfect hands, gearing can do you great. But some of my best returns, my mid-cap momentum portfolio last year did 42%. There are not many people who trade gearing who beat it. One of them is Garth McKenzie. He did around 50% last year trading with gearing. Of course, Garth sits in front of his screen. I don't. Mid-cap portfolio, buy at the beginning of the year, sell at the end, walk away. My top 40 uh, momentum portfolio in 2012 did about 40 odd percent. I think it was, I forget the number, 42, 44 percent, 40 somewhere. It was around the 40 plus number. So it's not necessarily about gearing. And in fact, gearing is often a double edged sword or a loaded bullet. Pick your uh, cliche as you wish. So that's my five cents, ladies and gents. Let's take some uh, questions. Uh, Peter. If a stock is way above valuation and on the momentum list, do you trade it? Peter, yes. I just saw my buy it, no questions asked. Um, and you know what? It works. Last year, Aspen, got in, it was expensive. What happened? It became significantly more. Coronation did me 100% growth last year. It went from very expensive to insanely expensive. Small caps, small caps are a good question. So. Small caps, do we trade them or do we invest them? I mean, I've had the conversation with, with, with um, Keith McLachlan. I call Keith a trader because a lot of his positions, his average holding period is maybe, I don't know what it is, but to me, if you hold for less than three years, you're a trader. And a lot of small caps are less than three years. And perhaps that's our lack of discipline more than anything else. Maybe that's the bigger issue. But I do think that uh, small caps broadly fit in the, trading quasi investing space and they are risky because they can collapse we've absolutely seen it before <clears throat> gavin uh, surely the risk after gearing is at the value of the stop loss not the full geared value uh, yes gavin you're 100 right the assumption is is quite simply does one action the stop loss 
you know, if we're brilliant at stop loss, then gearing's not the problem. Gearing's the problem if we're bad at stop loss. Now, that's not 100% true because with gearing, a stock can very quickly, say we close tonight and you're hovering just above your stop loss and we open tomorrow and that particular stock is down 2 or 3% in the first trade. Yeah, your gearing's going to slam you through your stop loss. So there is some nuance there to it. But if one is brilliant at stop loss, and what I mean by brilliant at stop loss is simply that you always action it, you always exit every time, no questions. And I can't stress how critically important that is. I can't stress how that is why I make money trading, because I am, I, I am ruthless with stop loss. Better word than brilliant, I am ruthless. So, Gavin, yeah, if you're great at stop loss and you, if you are ruthless with stop loss, then that in many senses negates the issue around the gearing. Another question coming through from Chantal. Chantal, I'm not sure if I fully get your question. If I don't, uh, throw it back at me. She's saying, as, 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 uh, uh, okay, I do understand you. Yes, so, so Chantal, in my equity portfolios, I run a core satellite. So the core is I put a chunk of that cash into ETFs, and then and by a chunk, I mean almost half, and then I put the rest into a selection of individual stocks. And then I have a small slice that goes into the trading space. What I define trading, yeah, anything that you buy with an intention to sell within three years, you're a trader. So any geared product, I can't think of a single geared product that doesn't that, 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 that will give you three years. Even if it, you know, even a, 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 a CFD, you could hold it for three years, but the cost is going to be onerous. Now, if that's coronation that you hold for three years, that's fine, because you know what? Your, your interest payment is going to be significantly offset by the profit that you've made. Ladies and gents, we will leave it there. Uh, we've slightly overrun the time, but not by as much as I had feared we might. I suppose the key point I want to say here is there's no silver bullet in many senses. But what I'm doing here is giving you things to think about. I'm, I'm throwing things out there for you to ponder about, if nothing else, just to start to think, hang on a second, what is the risk in my trading portfolio and how can I manage that risk? Can I reduce it and the like? And how do I make that acceptable to me so that a market correction doesn't wipe me out? Johan, stop loss day trading equals 2%. Uh, stop loss swing trading, same. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, and, I mean, if you not so much a two percent rule, but as to what level your swing trader stop loss is often a lot tighter than that because you're you're trading off a support or resistance, so you put the stop loss just the other side of it. Um, hot stocks no stop loss, PSG minus four percent stop loss or differ. Yeah, there's always going to be different points, and you know, even within my system. So on my lazy systems, I use the fifteen or thirty uh, exponential moving average. Um, as, as my stop losses. And what you're talking about here is where do you position the stop loss? And Warren Peacock will be doing a webcast for us uh, on the 11 March, two weeks time on stop loss. Where do you position it? And, and that, as many as there are people, there are ways to position or places to position it. So the 2% rule, first you position the stop loss, then 2% tells you quantity to buy. I'm not saying your stop loss is 2%. You use that for the quantity that you buy. And then from that, your next point is be ruthless when it's triggered. That is the critical part around it. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there.